ranking nine different versions of Snow White. Nearly a year ago, we ranked different versions of Cinderella's ball gown, and it is still the most popular video on this channel. I've since received dozens of comments asking for other ranking videos covering different princesses, and I'm happy to announce that that day has finally come. Today, we're going to be looking at nine different versions of Snow White in both film and TV. Although I'm sure you probably expected a comparison of their dresses, since Snow White's story doesn't revolve around a dress or a transformation like Cinderella's does, we'll actually be looking at the adaptations as a whole, from the characters to the costuming and, of course, the story itself. Just to preface this, I'm sorry if I didn't talk about your favorite iteration of Snow White. There have been a lot of retellings, and for the sake of this video and my own sanity, I wanted to keep the list as compact as possible. Anyway, let's get into it. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs Disney's first animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, is widely considered to be one of the most influential films in history. Not only was it one of the company's first massive successes, but it solidified the Disney princess format long before it was formed. Were you poisoned? No. Cursed? No. Have you ever had true love's kiss? Ew, barf! Do you have daddy issues? I don't even have a mom! Neither do we! Based on the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, Snow White is a kind and beautiful princess who lives with her wicked stepmother. The queen is incredibly vain and worries that Snow White will one day become more beautiful than her, and as such attempts to hide the girl's beauty by dressing her in rags and forcing her to work in the castle. One day the queen's magic mirror announces that Snow White is now the fairest in the land, and in a fit of rage and jealousy, the queen orders her huntsmen to kill Snow White and bring back her heart. Unable to complete the task, the huntsman lets Snow White escape, using the heart of a pig to trick the queen into thinking the princess is dead. After escaping into the woods, Snow White comes across the seven dwarves' cottage, mistakenly believing it is a home for orphaned children. The dwarves welcome Snow White into their home after she promises to cook and clean for them while they're working in the mines. The group enjoys a time of peace and happiness, with Snow White winning over even the grumpiest of the dwarves. But this comes to an end when the queen, who has discovered that Snow White is still alive, turns herself into an old woman and tricks Snow White into eating a poisoned apple. The dwarves and Snow White's animal friends chase down the queen, where she falls from a cliff to her death, something that went on to become a Disney trope. With Snow White seemingly dead, the dwarves encase her in a glass coffin, unwilling to bury her. One day a young prince comes across the coffin and, struck by her beauty, gives Snow White a kiss, which breaks the spell and awakens her. Everyone is overjoyed, and Snow White and her prince ride off for their happily ever after. The end. Compared to some of Disney's other princess films, this isn't one of my personal favorites, but that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve praise. Initially considered a waste of money, Hollywood referred to the project as, quote, Disney's folly while it was in production, but Snow White and the Seven Dwarves went on to become a critical and commercial success. As a result, Walt Disney was heralded as a genius, and at the 11th Academy Awards, he was thanked for pioneering a new field of entertainment, receiving an honorary award of one full-sized Oscar and seven miniature ones that were presented to him by Shirley Temple. Snow White's success allowed Disney to continue creating full-length feature films, which has culminated in a full-fledged media empire. If you're interested in learning more about the creation and development of the movie, Up Close by Ilhan has a great video all about it that I highly recommend checking out. In the original Brothers Grimm story, Snow White faces a couple more murder attempts. The queen initially gives her a bodice that tightens around her and stops her breathing, which Snow White is cut out of, as well as a poisoned comb, which is removed from her hair. Disney only kept the final attempt, the poisoned apple, in their story, which made such an impact on the public that to this day, that is what Snow White is most associated with. Disney also changed how the queen dies. In the original, the prince gives her a pair of hot iron slippers to dance in until she dies. A bit of a gruesome death for a children's film. Considering this was the first time anything like this had been done before, I think the changes were appropriate. Disney had to create something that was actually doable while also keeping the heart of the story and making it entertaining. A very tall order. The most memorable parts of the film are probably when the dwarves are on screen. While yes, they're a bit one note, they do provide some much needed humor to an otherwise dark story. The evil queen is a legend, and although her motivations are quite simple, she makes an impact. Snow White is a touch bland for me, coming off as sickly sweet, but considering she's meant to be quite young, the innocence and naivete works. And there's no denying that her character design is quite unique compared to the rest of Disney's princess lineup. You might notice that Snow White shares a striking resemblance to another animated icon of the time, Betty Boop, 
which isn't a coincidence. Disney specifically sought out animator Grim Natwick to work on the project after seeing his work on Betty Boop and particularly loved his understanding of women's anatomy. Snow White's overall look, from her hair to her makeup, are quite similar to Betty's, but were also generally in style around the time. I flip back and forth between liking and disliking Snow White's dress, and today, I like it. Compared to the rest of the Disney princesses, her dress is quite distinct, not just in silhouette, but also in color. While some of the other princesses do have yellow or blue in their color palette, none of them can be confused with Snow White, which is honestly a great thing when it comes to animation and designing characters. However, I do think an all red dress would have been nice to match her lips and the apple, but that's just me. Snow White's wardrobe, as well as the wardrobe of the Evil Queen, takes the majority of their inspiration from popular fashions of the 1930s, with hints of historical dress sprinkled throughout. Carolina Zabrowska has a video on her channel where she created a historically accurate Snow White costume that is incredibly impressive. And over on Glamour, Raisa Britannia broke down what the film got right and wrong about their looks. Mina Leigh also has some great videos where she ranks all the Disney princesses and villains based on their wardrobe, which I also recommend checking out. The weakest point of this film is probably the love interest. While he and Snow White do meet early on, and it's implied that they very quickly develop feelings for one another, considering he makes no other appearances until the end of the film, it does make their reunion a little off-putting. At least Aurora and her prince actually spoke to one another before he went and kissed her while she was unconscious. It's easy to nitpick the storyline now, but I do think there was a missed opportunity to not have the prince and Snow White meet one another a few times in the forest before having him break the curse. But there were already seven other men in her life at that point, so I get it. If it's been a while since you've watched Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, or you've never watched it at all, it might be worth checking out again. The music is still fantastic, and the art style is gorgeous to look at, and it does have a magical quality that I've been missing in some of Disney's newer works. But I will say, I miss when Disney would open and close on a storybook. I feel like they should bring that back. Happily Ever After There's a very high chance you've never heard of this movie. Produced by the now-defunct Filmation, Happily Ever After was plagued with production woes from the very beginning. Because they often made unofficial continuations of other animated films, the company was issued a lawsuit by the Walt Disney Company, which forced Filmation to make numerous changes to their story to ensure its characters would not overtly resemble Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The movie reportedly finished production in 1989, but it wouldn't be until 1993 that it was finally able to be released in the US and was both a box office and critical failure. I randomly found it on VHS at a garage sale as a kid and was completely obsessed with it. You can actually watch the whole movie here on YouTube, so if you're interested, I genuinely recommend checking it out. It's a really fun time. Taking place immediately after the death of the Evil Queen, Snow White and her prince are preparing to get married when they are attacked by the Evil Queen's vengeful brother, Lord Malice. The prince is captured, but Snow White is able to escape, running to the dwarves' cottage, only to discover that their magic-wielding female cousins, the Dwarf Elves, are now living there. Together, they all venture to Lord Malice's castle to try and save the prince. Upon arriving, they work together to stop him, and Snow White and her prince are reunited. A lot of other things happen as well, but there's actually a pretty decent plot twist, and I don't want to spoil it for you. Sorry. The art style can take some getting used to, as it's very different from Disney's, but I like it. It's kind of reminiscent of some of Don Bluth's work. While Snow White's dress isn't my favorite, I do like the rest of her character design, especially that they made her look less like a child and more like a young woman. While it doesn't have much in common with the source material, it is a solid continuation of the Snow White story without being generic. In fact, I'd say that it's more creative than some of the official Disney sequels. As a villain, Lord Malice might even be greater than the original Evil Queen. Controversial, I know. But his motivations are greater than simple jealousy and vanity. Not only is he seeking revenge, but he's also attempting to prove that he's now the most powerful person in the kingdom. Plus, he's really creepy. As a kid, I despised him, and there's a certain sequence near the end of the movie where he all out terrified me. Honestly, for a kid's movie, it's kind of dark. The Dwarf Elves not only have interesting personalities, but also creative character designs that I'm sure any kid would instantly fall in love with. Where Dopey is the star of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, Thunderella is happily ever afters. She actually has a really inspiring storyline that culminates in genuine character growth. Plus, her little introduction song is super cute. Shine too. 
And where the Disney film failed to give the prince and Snow White actual personalities, this film remedies that and actually makes you root for them as a couple. Instead of being a stereotypical damsel in distress, this film makes Snow White the hero. She wants to rescue the prince, not the other way around. And she's kind and caring without being a pushover. The rest of the female characters are also powerful and strong, but without it coming off as pandering, something that even films of today struggle with. The music is very of its time, taking on an electro-pop style that is ridiculously catchy and fun, so if you like synth, then this movie will be a delight. <laughs> Listen, kid, I think you should know, bad like me is the way to go. Snow White, A Tale of Terror For those who may not be familiar with this film, in tone and aesthetic, it's quite similar to the 1998 Merlin miniseries, which funnily enough also starred Sam Neill, combined with 1998's Ever After. So if you enjoyed either of those, this is the movie for you. In A Tale of Terror, Snow White, known as Lily, is played by Monica Kina, and her stepmother, Claudia, is played by Sigourney Weaver. Claudia initially starts off as a kind and caring woman who genuinely tries her best to get along with Lily, although the young girl rebuffs her constantly. As Lily grows up, she grows more beautiful, but also vain and selfish. On the night of a ball, she wears a dress of her mother's, not only directing all the guests' attention away from Claudia, but her father's as well. Claudia suffers a miscarriage and is subsequently infertile. This traumatic experience, along with the evil power of a magic mirror, makes the formerly kind-hearted Claudia swear revenge on Lily. Claudia sends her brother to kill Lily, but he is unable to, allowing the girl to escape. When Claudia discovers his betrayal, she curses him, which results in his death. In the woods, Lily has begun living with a group of miners who take her under their wing. The experience doesn't begin pleasantly, as one of them actually attempts to assault her, but Will, their leader, saves her. Claudia uses magic to create a cave-in at the mines to kill Lily, but fails. She tries again by summoning a large wind to knock down the trees and crush Lily to death, but is thwarted once again. Claudia eventually disguises herself as an old woman and tricks Lily into eating a poisoned apple, which puts her into a death-like state. Will, who has since fallen in love with Lily, finds her and places her in a glass coffin. He eventually notices that her eyes have opened and he shakes her, dislodging the piece of apple that had been stuck in her throat and bringing her back to life. Lily and her comrades head to the castle where they battle with Claudia and the cursed household. While Lily and Claudia fight, she's able to stab the mirror and kill her, eventually going to join Will and her father. The end. I actually like that Lily starts off as a childish brat and that the stepmother genuinely wants to befriend her. It's a more realistic portrayal of the relationship between the two of them, while also making the father's choice to marry Claudia understandable. In other iterations, I always wonder why Snow White's father, who is supposed to be this kind, caring man, marries such a wicked woman in the first place. This movie solves that problem. Plus, by giving the queen a stronger motivation than simple jealousy, we as the audience feel a bit more sympathetic towards her. There is quite a lot of gore and graphic violence in this film that I think works for a retelling of Snow White, which in itself is a very dark story. There are enough changes to the material that it seems original, while still following the classic beats of the fairy tale that we know and love. Merritt Allen, the costume designer for the film, did a really great job at creating a distinctive look for the characters. Everyone looks like they could exist in the same time period and place. You'd be surprised how often costume designers mess that up. There is one exception, of course, the white velvet gown that Lily wears to the ball, which is basically a 90s prom dress. If she'd been in something white, but still in the same world as the other costumes, I think it would have been much less jarring. One thing about this film that I really dislike is Will and Lily's relationship. Not because it doesn't work in the context of the film, but because I think the actors were wildly miscast. At the time of filming, Monica Kina was only 17 and she looks like a child, whereas Gil Bellows is a full-grown man at 30. He looks much more like her father than he does her lover, and it's really disconcerting to watch. Lily's other love interest, Peter, who doesn't really serve much of a purpose, at least looks closer in age. Snow White, the fairest of them all. This 2001 take on the tale was made for TV, and boy, is that obvious. While the heart of the story remains, they do make a few changes. 
although I don't think they were good ones. Snow White's widowed father, John, becomes king after releasing a creature known as the Green-Eyed One. As part of their deal, the Green-Eyed One must grant John three wishes, and he schemes to make his sister, Elspeth, the new bride while also giving her a magical mirror. One day, Elspeth's magic mirrors reveal that Snow White is now the most beautiful woman in all the land, and following with the original story, she orders a hunter to kill Snow White and bring back her heart. After discovering Snow White is still alive, she attempts to kill her with an enchanted ribbon, but Snow White is saved by the seven dwarves, each named after a day of the week, who have the ability to transform into a rainbow and transport anywhere they wish. Discovering that Snow White is still alive, Elspeth transforms herself into Snow White's deceased mother and offers her a poisoned apple. Finally believing that she has won, Elspeth tries to turn back into the queen, but instead reverts back to her true form. The green-eyed one reappears and reveals that what she has done has cost her her beauty. Snow White in her ice coffin is visited by Prince Alfred, who is turned into a bear by Elspeth, and she is revived. The spells on everyone are broken, and Elspeth is killed by a group of gnomes she had cursed. I'm not going to be too hard on the costuming here, considering they likely had a very low budget. Since they're just attempting to create a generically fantastical look, there's very little regard for time period and setting, and as such, some characters are dressed in medieval clothing, others in Tudor styles, and some in Rococo fashions. This dissonance in costuming winds up giving the entire production a cheap, unprofessional feel, which is a shame because I actually think that Snow White's costuming has potential. I love me some Miranda Richardson, and I think she's a solid choice for the evil stepmother, but her talent sticks out like a sore thumb in a film filled with less than stellar performances. While I do think Kristen Crook makes for an excellent looking Snow White, her acting is a touch too stiff to make us feel for the character, and her delivery is a bit too modern. Where did you come from? The film as a whole also suffers from a pacing issue. It takes nearly an hour for any drama to unfold, and then in 20 minutes the movie is over. The few changes that the film makes to the original story, the prince turning into a bear, the dwarves turning into a rainbow, and the green-eyed one granting wishes are relatively pointless and don't serve any narrative purpose except to make the story a little more magical. A great example is the scene where all the garden gnomes come to life and kill the queen, which on a side note, looks cursed as hell, but it also makes no sense. If you were going to turn Alfred into a bear, why not have him kill her before rescuing Snow White? Don't just make silly changes for the hell of it. Sydney White. In the 90s and 2000s, we saw a huge influx in contemporary adaptations of classic literature. 10 Things I Hate About You was a retelling of William Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, Clueless was an adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma, and Cruel Intentions was a modernized take on Dangerous Liaisons. Following in the footsteps of 2004's massively popular A Cinderella Story, Sidney White was pushed into production as a way to profit off of the fairy tale formula and also Amanda Bynes' budding stardom. Sidney is a tomboyish, down-to-earth college freshman with a serious case of accidental, not-like-other-girls syndrome. You better keep this! You clearly need the practice! You? Really? Yeah. Is it the shoes? No, I love the shoes. Want some breakfast? I can't do anything, anything I want to do. Help yourself. Breakfast is good. Who are you, Sydney White? Throw a football like Matt Leinard. Fearlessly conquer fraternity bathrooms and clean up nice to boot. <laughs> well, I'm more of a Pete Manning, Leinard's a lefty. Marry me. <laughs> Instead of an evil stepmother, this film's antagonist is Rachel Witchburn, the president of both the student council and the sorority Sydney hopes to join. Played by 2000s chick flick legend Sarah Paxton, Rachel immediately has it out for Sydney after seeing her with her ex boyfriend Tyler Prince. During the pledge process, Rachel attempts to get Sydney kicked out of the sorority, only for Sydney to overcome all the difficult tasks while simultaneously making a positive impression on the other students. Rachel is obsessed with the school's hot or not list, of which she's long been at the top of, but she begins to grow more and more jealous of Sydney after seeing her rising popularity on the site. Rachel? Rachel, use your soothing words. Prada, Gucci, Chanel, Sydney, Sydney, Sydney! Prada, Gucci, Chanel, 
Armani. Try your soothing words? I don't need my soothing words. Rachel's schemes eventually pan out and Sydney is kicked out of the sorority, but she's welcomed by members of the Vortex, a dilapidated house of outcasts. As Sydney gets to know the boys in the house, this film's version of the Seven Dwarves, they discover that Rachel and the school intend to kick them out and demolish the Vortex. They hatch a plan to have one of the boys run for student council president against Rachel, but fail when it's discovered that he graduated several years earlier. Sydney eventually decides to run against Rachel for student council president. With her campaign focusing on diversity and equality, in stark contrast to Rachel's that promotes elitism and exclusive based on popularity and appearances. The day before the election, Rachel hires a hacker to destroy Sydney's computer using a virus called the Poison Apple. And as a result, Sydney has to pull an all-nighter to redo her work. She accidentally falls asleep and is almost late to the election, but is woken up by Tyler with a kiss. Sydney wins the election, becoming the new president, while Rachel is kicked out of the sorority. The movie ends with the vortex getting fixed up and its dorky residents finally enjoying college. I'll be honest and say that this isn't Amanda Bynes' best work. It feels like a lot of other characters that she's played, but with a far worse script. Because of her over-the-top humor and excess quirkiness, the character just doesn't feel like she exists in the same world as everyone else, especially when she's conversing with Rachel or Tyler, who act in a much more natural way. And I don't even think it's her fault. It feels like someone told her to just act exactly like she did in She's the Man, and they left it at that. Since this was filmed in 2006, we get to see a lot of mid-2000s fashion. Extreme side bangs, baby dolls, dresses, v-neck t-shirts, and ballet flats. We haven't reached full-blown maximalist madness yet, but we're getting there. If you're looking for Y2K inspo, this probably isn't the movie for you. The movie as a whole is pretty obvious and generic, to the point it kind of feels like fan fiction, but if you're a fan of 2008's House Bunny, you'll probably like it. They're incredibly similar in plot and tone. On a side note, I'm genuinely surprised that the A Cinderella Story series hasn't tried out a college sorority setting yet. Evil sorority sisters, a wicked house mother, it'd be way better than the awful musicals they've been turning out recently. Once Upon a Time I was madly in love with this show back in the day, but lost interest around season four. Looking back at it now, I can understand why it had such a devout following as the premise was wildly unique. The series isn't directly centered around Snow White and her fairy tale, but she does play a rather large role. Because there are seven seasons, it'd be tough to go through every little thing that happens, so I'm just gonna focus on the basics. Once Upon a Time is set in the fictional town of Storybrooke, and its residents are actually famous fairy tale characters that were transported to the real world after the evil queen put a curse on them. Having forgotten their past lives, they spend their days doing the same thing over and over again, unaware that time is passing around them. Things eventually begin to change and move forward when Emma Swan, the daughter of Snow White and Prince Charming, comes to town for her son, who has been adopted by the evil queen Regina, who has now become the mayor of Storybrooke and the only person with a happy ending. Like many characters in the show, Snow White has two identities, her fairy tale self and her storybook counterpart. In the original world, Snow White is a sweet and naive girl who accidentally ruins the evil queen's chances of happiness when she inadvertently causes the death of her true love. This leads to the evil queen seeking revenge on Snow White, which leads to Snow becoming a bandit and eventually culminates in Regina releasing the curse on the land. She and her partner, Prince Charming, have a poor impression of one another initially, but grow to have the truest love in the whole series. In the alternate world, Snow White, now Mary Margaret, has been separated from Charming, now David Nolan, but they continue to be drawn to one another in spite of this. Because Snow White is given a good deal of attention throughout the show, her backstory and personality is given a lot of time to develop, and as a result, she's one of the most fully formed versions of Snow White that we've seen. Her character is far from perfect, but that's part of what makes her so real, and her relationship with Charming and her daughter is a big reason to keep watching the show. 
Once Upon a Time was renowned for its costuming, and although many characters had literal costumes that were inspired by Disney, Snow White and the Evil Queen both had a lot of interesting, unique, creative outfits, at least in their fairy tale forms. Because we see them change over a period of time, it's interesting to see how they dress differently depending on their circumstance and status. There's some 2010s influence when it comes to the styling of the characters, but it's far less noticeable than, say, Rain. Mirror, mirror. In the early 2010s, there were a bunch of movies that were released around the same time as one another with eerily similar premises. No strings attached and friends with benefits, killers and night and day, and of course, Mirror, Mirror and Snow White and the Huntsman. Released exactly two months before the latter film, Mirror Mirror attempted a more comedic and camp take on the classic fairy tale, with less of an emphasis on action and more on fantasy. Starring Lily Collins as Snow White and Julia Roberts as her evil stepmother, the movie is significantly more lighthearted in tone than others on this list and is probably the one that reminds me most of Disney's 1937 film. The movie begins by explaining that the king has gone missing and his new wife Clementiana now rules in his absence, taxing the citizens heavily and treating her stepdaughter Snow White with disdain. After all, you've done nothing to me, caused no problems. And yet, there is something about you that's just so incredibly irritating. Having been confined to the castle for the majority of her life, Snow White sneaks outside, where she meets Prince Andrew Alcott, and the two quickly become infatuated with one another. In an attempt to marry the prince and take his wealth, the queen throws a ball, which Snow White secretly attends, although her ruse is quickly discovered. The queen tells her manservant to leave Snow White for dead in the forest, but she finds herself at the dwarves' hideout. The dwarves, who've been mistreated, now live in the woods as bandits. Snow White and the dwarves eventually team up, hoping to use the money they get from robbing the rich to help the poorer townspeople. Prince Alcott goes into the woods to fight them and discovers that Snow White is still alive, and the two are seemingly less enamored with one another as a result of this confusion. You're with the bandits? You're with the queen! Using magic, the queen tricks the prince into drinking a love potion and also attacks Snow White with two giant marionettes which Snow White defeats. After abducting the prince before his wedding to the queen, Snow White kisses him, breaking the spell. Because she's used her magic excessively, the queen ages rapidly, and at Snow White's wedding, she offers her an apple. Before biting into it, Snow White realizes who the woman is, and instead of taking a bite, she offers it to the queen herself. Victorious, Snow White lives happily ever after. Unlike many other adaptations, this movie gives Snow White time and motivation to change. Although meek and naive at the beginning of the film, we can see her grow stronger in both courage and confidence. Although it's a little bit hard to think of Lily Collins as a terrifying foe, we're given enough time to see her hone her skills that it doesn't seem like a complete joke when she suddenly starts fighting. A big problem that I think this film has is with its queen. Not because Julia Roberts didn't do a fantastic job, but because her character doesn't fit with the rest. This could be a problem with either the script or the direction, but the queen's behavior comes off as cartoonish and unrealistic when compared to the rest of the more subdued performances. I think if they wanted to go for this sort of over-the-top tone, everyone should have followed suit. Her scenes are the most entertaining in the whole film, but they stick out like a sore thumb. Lily Collins is a fantastic choice for the role of Snow White, not only in appearance, but she naturally exudes an innocence and youthfulness that I associate with the character. But I do find that she's a bit too serious for a film that's otherwise quite funny. And the prince, played by Army Hammer, is a pompous, childish asshole who is wildly unlikable. Put it down. We're done playing. Or did you not learn enough from your spankings? Along with Sandy Powell's work for 2015 Cinderella, this is right up there as one of my favorite costumes for a fairy tale film. All of Aiko Ishioka's work is fantastic, but for me, this film really stands out. But I do have a penchant for poofy skirts and elaborate sleeves. There's a lot of really amazing textures and details, especially on the queen's clothing, but both she and Snow White have such bright and vibrant clothing that it's really a sight to behold. I just wish the rest of the set design wasn't so muted in color, because it kind kind of looks a bit depressing. I know some people hate the ending where they're all singing, but director Tarsum Singh wanted it to be an ode to Bollywood. Had there been more musical numbers as a whole, I honestly think the film would have been way better. It needed to be significantly more theatrical and exaggerated to get its point across. I, I think she's the most beautiful woman in the whole world. Agree to disagree, let's leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Do you know her? Ivory skin, 
black hair. Her hair is not black, it's raven, and she's 18 years old, and her skin has never seen the sun, so of course it's good. Snow White and the Huntsman In comparison to Mirror Mirror, Snow White and the Huntsman went a darker, more action-forward route. After the death of her mother, Snow White's father is immediately smitten with Ravenna, a beautiful sorceress who's been controlling the Dark Army. On their wedding night, Ravenna murders him, taking over the throne and locking Snow White away in a tower. Years pass and the kingdom is in ruins. Ravenna has been capturing young women in the kingdom and draining them of their youth and beauty in order to sustain hers. Ravenna learns from her magic mirror that Snow White is destined to destroy her. Ravenna orders her brother to kill Snow White, but he fails, and Snow White escapes into the dark forest where Ravenna has no power. She hires a huntsman, Eric, to find Snow White and bring her back, but he betrays the queen once finding out that she lied to him. He and Snow White eventually meet a band of eight dwarves who join them on their journey. Ravenna disguises herself as Snow White's childhood friend and love interest, William, tricking her into eating the poisoned apple. The real William kisses her, but she doesn't wake up until Eric does. She rallies an army to fight against Ravenna, and along with Eric, William, and the dwarves, they all infiltrate the castle. Snow White fights against Ravenna, nearly losing, but manages to wound her and win. The kingdom is freed, and Snow White is crowned queen. First things first, I'm not anti Kristen Stewart. In fact, I think she's quite good in films that play to her strengths, but I don't buy her as Snow White. Her face has a hardness that I don't think suits a character who is meant to be sweet and innocent. But where they did excel in casting is with the evil queen. Charlize Theron made this entire movie and it's honestly one of her best performances. It doesn't hurt that she's decked out in absolutely amazing costumes the entire time either. Even though there's no denying that Ravenna is absolutely horrible, we also feel some pity for her as her beauty has undoubtedly put her in a lot of terrible situations. Like A Tale of Terror, which also had Snow White end up with someone who wasn't the prince, I found myself conflicted about this turnout. Not because of the age difference, but because we know that Eric is still in love with his wife and that Snow reminds him of her. So the relationship feels a little disingenuous on that front. Prince William has cared for her since they were children, and they do eventually get married in the sequel, while Eric winds up back with his wife. The argument could be made that Snow White loves both of them in different ways, but realistically, it just feels like they couldn't commit to one or the other. The entire ending battle is incredibly ridiculous to watch because Snow White has not shown a single moment of actual swordsmanship. It comes off as a fake woke girl power moment instead of something inspirational. If they'd at least set it up like she'd been practicing while locked in her tower, it'd be at least a bit more believable, but instead all I can think about is how she'd get in everyone's way. Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarves Released in 2019, the South Korean animated film was hit with controversy before it was even released. Marketing for the film, which was released in 2017, was heavily criticized for allegedly promoting fat shaming by centering the plot around a girl with shoes that magically made her thin and beautiful. Many presumed that the story would revolve around her wanting to change her appearance and that her image would be made a joke. After finally watching the film myself, I can say that it's the exact opposite. Literally in the first five minutes, they tell you the true point of the film, that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover and that beauty is what's on the inside. The movie begins with a group of heroic princes called the Fearless Seven, who mistakenly think a fairy princess is a witch because of her appearance, and she curses them into green dwarves as punishment. How are we supposed to know she looks like a witch and everyone knows that a princess doesn't look like a witch? Their spell will only be broken after they receive a kiss from the most beautiful woman in the world. An evil witch named Regina has married King White and taken over the kingdom. When his incredibly strong daughter, Snow White, returns home, she finds a pair of red shoes that Regina has created from a magical apple tree, and upon putting them on, she becomes thin. Not recognizing her, Regina attacks Snow White, who runs away to try and find the Fearless Seven to help her rescue her father and save the kingdom. Because her appearance has changed, the Fearless Seven don't recognize who she is, and she gives them a false name. Believing she is the woman who will break their curse, they promise to help her save her father in the hopes that it will make her fall in love with them. They all begin to grow close to one another, with the men appreciating her for her personality, not just her looks. And she eventually begins to fall in love with the leader, Merlin. She admits her feelings for him and the two kiss, but to their surprise, the curse doesn't break. She eventually reveals the truth about herself and her appearance, and he admits that if he had known the truth, he 
probably wouldn't have helped her, revealing his own shallowness. Regina captures Snow and forces her to eat a magical apple. When Snow refuses, Regina threatens to kill Merlin. Snow finally accepts, biting into the apple and turning into an apple tree. Before Merlin can be killed, the rest of the Fearless Seven save him and a battle ensues. Merlin sacrifices himself to kill Regina and save Snow. And as he's dying, Snow gives him one last kiss, which is able to break the curse and revive him. If you liked Nomeo and Juliet, you'll probably like this film. The humor and tone is very similar, but this isn't as childish. There's a good balance of emotional heartfelt moments, as well as action and comedy. What's really amazing about this film is that at no point is Snow White framed as being uncomfortable or unhappy with her original appearance. She's confident in herself. It's other people who have an inability to accept her as she is because of their own insecurities. Can I actually have my shoes back? <laughs> no way. You're not serious, are you? I'm really not in the mood. Could you just please give them back to me? Ha! They won't even fit on you! They're gonna fit me better than they fit you. Hey! Merlin is the one with the biggest hang-up about appearances, his own especially, and he has to learn to accept people for who they truly are. Honestly, it's a really great message. The Rankings Now that we've gone through all nine versions of Snow White, let's get into the rankings, starting from the worst and ending with the best. This is going to be heavily biased, so don't take it too seriously if your favorite isn't mine. Number nine, Snow White, the fairest of them all. The low budget really shows, and I just can't think of anything good to say about it besides the fact that Miranda Richardson was employed. The changes they made to the story were utterly useless, and the pacing was a mess. 8. Sydney White This is by no means a bad movie, but compared to the rest on this list, it just doesn't make much of an impact. I will, however, applaud the very clever ways they modernized the story, like the computer virus infecting Sydney's Apple computer. 7. Mirror Mirror The inconsistent tone really ruins the experience for me, especially because I think all of the pieces were there. Utterly amazing costuming, but the script could have used some work. 6. Snow White and the Huntsman It's the superior Snow White film from 2012, but it's by no means the best Snow White film out there. It can thank its high production value and Charlize Theron for not ranking lower. 5. Happily Ever After Yes, this is largely due to childhood nostalgia, but I promise if you watch it, you'll understand what I mean. I love the more feminist take that this film has, which was very ahead of its time if I might add, and the characters actually have really great personalities. I would rank it higher, but I held myself back considering it's not actually an adaptation of the original Snow White story. 4. Once Upon a Time I'm gonna go rewatch the show now because I completely forgot how genius the premise was. It really does a great job of developing Snow White's relationship with other characters, especially Prince Charming and the Evil Queen. But it's also really interesting to see an imperfect princess. But they also had seven seasons to do it, while everything else on this list had a movie. 3. Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarves for those of you who haven't watched this film, I'm sure this comes as a total surprise. But trust me, that's how good it actually is. The entire lesson of the film is not to judge a book by its cover, and unfortunately, that's what the general public did. Give it a chance. 2. Snow White, A Tale of Terror a Tale of Terror really stands out in a sea of other Snow White movies, probably because it's the only version that feels really and truly dark. I'd change the love interest, but otherwise it's solid. 1. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves It's a classic for a reason. Sure, compared to some of the newer Disney movies, it isn't as showy, but it set the course for animated film for decades, and it really is beautiful to look at. After watching all these different versions of Snow White, I'm intrigued to see how the story will play out next. I'd love to see a darker and grittier version that closely followed the Brothers Grimm story, Iron Shoes and all, or even an adaptation of Gail Carson Levine's Fairest would be quite fun as well. Because it's essentially inevitable that Disney is going to make a live action Snow White in the near future, who would you be interested in seeing as Snow White next? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!